is a uh, i'm guessing all of you are mtech quantum mill some glad to see you all here um uh, so also for uh, those of you who are attending qt 201 i just talked to bala and the class will start at 5:30 okay so you don't have to rush or anything um uh, right so about the speaker today so uh, jaisa mahapat sima is a kimota uh, professor of mechanical and nuclear engineering with a courtesy appointment in electrical and computer engineering at virginia commonwealth university uh, he has been visiting us for the past month uh, as the first uh, visiting quantum technology uh, faculty his current research interests include nanomagnetism electronics nanomagnetic memory neuromorphic computing and quantum computing devices he is a fellow of the asme and i triple e senior member and past chair for the technical committee on spintronics i triple e nanotechnology council today uh, he'll talk to us about classical and uh, classical and quantum computing with spins um, thank you akshay for the kind introduction am i audible clear okay so also before i begin i would like to thank arindam and apurva as well as akshay for uh, inviting me over to the ipqi i enjoyed my stay and interactions here and last but not least i'd like to thank shri vidya because without all the coordination none of this would have been possible um so again thank you for the opportunity to give this talk i am i go by atul and i'm from the virginia commonwealth university today i'm going to be talking about computing with spins uh, all the way from single spins to an ensemble or a collection of spins which is an anomaly uh, that's really good let me just try and do the convention and recording so please okay sure. so also uh, this is one number for the students since it might be a first talk you can always ask questions just raise your hand and just go ahead and ask sure. questions okay don't feel shy okay so i'm going to be talking about classical and quantum computing we are going to visit the whole space of spins from single spins which point up down to a collection of spins which rotate coherently for example in a nanomagnet uh so the talk will look at three different parts the first is basic experimental demonstrations on how we can use voltage to control magnetism at the nano scale one is to look at the magnetoelastic effect where you apply a strain the strain from the piezoelectric layer produces a strain in the magnetostrictive layer so it's straining the lattice and because of spin orbit coupling when you deform the lattice the spin also rotates that's how you rotate the magnetization the other is going to be use of direct voltage control of anisotropy this happens because there's an oxide and the p shell of the oxygen overlap with the d shell of your soft ferromagnet and when you apply an electric field you can change the anisotropy in the soft magnet from out of plane to in plane and vice versa but we are going to add an additional dimension of complexity here we are going to use that to also in systems where there's something called the dyshinsky moria interaction so we can create and destroy skernions and this once we look into this fundamental results the a voltage control of magnetism at the nano scale we can look at its applications for memory space that is conventional random access memory as well as potentially for neuromorphic computing and finally we will look at quantum computing with spins where we use nano scale magnets to produce a local microwave or rf field um, which would only affect the nearby magnet and such uh, nano magnets can easily be accessed by using um crossbar array technology that's already um uh well developed and the idea is that the magnetic ac magnetic field generated by this could be made coincident with the lamor precession frequency of the spins here thereby producing uh qubit rotations in this qubit right right so this is a overview I'd like to acknowledge the different 
uh, graduate students who have been working over the years, starting from the SAW strain control, SAW FMI, neuromorphic computing, to the current work on skirmions and quantum control. Also like to acknowledge uh, my collaborators, um, starting from the more recent um, to the um, prior works that were all performed on different topics. Uh, so the talk outline, I'd start with motivation, why we are trying to use spins to do classical as well as quantum computing. Then we look into some basic competing energies at the nanoscale that help us explain the experimental results. Then we use this to project and see what kind of uh, memory and neuromorphic computing devices we can work with. And finally, look at our idea on quantum control of spins with nanoscale lines. So if you look at classical computing, one may wonder why we are looking at energy efficiency at all in the first place. So that's the starting point, and then we go to spins and nanomagnets and so on. So a single Google search can take you one kilojoules of energy. Two trillion searches a year cost this much energy annually, but this is just searches. If you look at servers, uh, searches, everything for combined, one single company's use of electricity for the compute needs in 2019, which is three years back, far exceeded the energy requirements of, say, Zambia or Sri Lanka. So given that this trend is exponentially increasing, very soon the cost of doing computation will be a big consumer of energy, right? And the energy needs of our society. So it is very important to minimize this energy. But there's also another reason. When you look at devices that are at the edge, they have one other issue that there is both a power and a hardware constraint. So you cannot have too much hardware or too much power on an embedded device, for example, a medical application or a sensor. So you need to be able to process information. The processing capability need not be great, but still you should be able to do it with low power. So these are the two motivating factors. Now, a little bit of historic context. So if you look at the work of Landauer and others, why they argue for nanomagnets, their conventional argument was at that time for a transistor, you needed N where N is equal to million electrons going into the channel and out in order to go from the on to the off state. And if P is the error probability, the energy they argued would be N KT log one by P error. So when this P error is very small, this is the energy needed for that switch. Whereas in the magnet, you could have 10 to the power five or 10 to the power six spins, but they're all exchange coupled to each other and the switch in a correlated fashion because of exchange coupling. So it's not exactly KT log one by P error because it's not one degree of freedom, but it's a few degrees of freedom, right? And this was inherently the advantage. However, right now this N has becoming less and less, and this, this is never going to be one KT because of inco incoherence and in switching. So this is really not the argument for magnetic uh, memory. But one thing which can never be taken away is non volatility So if you have a CMOS device with a transistor, you switch it off, the information is gone. Whereas in a magnet, that information is retained forever, for centuries, if the energy barrier between this state and a state it has to pass through to point down is one electron volt or 40 kT, you retain that information for centuries. So there is a huge advantage there when you can compute with this kind of memory, but the cost right now is also enormous because if you take a CMOS single switch, the energy dissipation is 100 attojoules per bit, whereas if you're going to use STT, which is spin transfer torque, incidentally, the way this works is that there's a magnetization pointing in this direction. So when an electron comes this way, it gets spin polarized, let's say pointing in this direction, which is incident on the free layer, and therefore you can switch it depending on the direction of the current to a magnetization parallel or anti-parallel to this layer. And when the two are parallel to each other, the electrons are transmitted because the spin is parallel. And when they're anti-parallel, the spin is reflected. So that's the low and high resistance state coming from tun tunneling magneto resistance. So you can read out this as well as you can write this, but the energy to write even 11 nanometer diameter EMTJ device is 100 femtojoules, which is now 1000 times the cost 
or switching the CMOS device. That's an enormous cost to pay for non volatility. So we are looking at two uh, ways in our lab using one strain and other using voltage control of magnetic anisotropy to switch the magnetization without a magnetic field and without a current using just voltage control. Right? And I'm going to go into the principle of the strain as well as VCMA a little later. Uh, the second motivation is uh, probably looking into scalable quantum computing. So our idea here is this. So let's say this is uh, either a single spin or an ensemble of uncoupled spins. You would like to have more spins like 50 spins, which are uncoupled just so that the readout is easier in terms of sensitivity. Now you have these nanoscale magnets here. You apply a voltage and you can move magnetization up and down, right? So let's say you actuate this at a gigahertz. You are producing a very local near field uh, AC field of one gigahertz. And if your electro spins are resonant to that frequency, then you can make this do pi, pi by two, any kind of rotation here and implement a single qubit uh, quantum gate. Now there are other issues that have to be solved and I can discuss that briefly like initializing this, entangling it and so on. And one promising candidate for this, for example, could be rare earth spins, which are relatively uh, uncoupled the electron spins from the environment. And uh, this is about 31 milliseconds coherence time at 1.2 Kelvin. So again, compared to superconducting qubits, you could get the advantage of operating at higher temperatures like Kelvin system, many Kelvin. But our main uh, innovation or interest here is the following. The most typical quantum computing schemes, let's say EDSR in a quantum dot uh, two spin qubit here, right? So the way this is implemented is passing microwaves of two different frequencies. Here is an NV center which is excited by spin waves. Here is a conventional transform qubit where you have multiple frequencies so that each frequency is resonant to a specific qubit and addresses that qubit, right? This is all done and propagated using waveguides. Whereas here we can locally control the qubit we are interested in. And if this is less than 100 nanometer, this is more than a micron, then this magnet will not really couple or affect this uh, qubit. And therefore this is more scalable and it's also amenable to existing crossbar technology, which is used in uh, semiconductor device. Uh, yeah. So I use like multiple spins in a single qubit. So I'll go about single versus multiple uh, spins. In practice, you could use a single spin for a, for a qubit, but the readout would be hard in the sense that you sense its magnetic state, right? So we have a couple of ideas here where you have um, isolated spins. So it's just an ensemble. It's for one, you have 50 and you're enhancing your readout. We have other ideas where you can try to exchange, couple them, and see if there's error correction, which I will go into. And what about the energy cost for pressing one spin versus multiple spin? Not really significantly different because the energy cost is only rotating the magnetization up and down in the nano magnet, right? The, it doesn't really matter whether you have one or multiple spins. If you have, let's say, five by five spins here, the only thing you must be concerned about is if there's a gradient in the AC field, you will start dephasing. Right? So the challenge there is to maintain the gradient so that they all see roughly the same magnetic field, and therefore they don't dephase faster than because of temperature and other things. How close can you stack them before they start talking to each other? So uh, in, it's interesting the dipole may be active like over uh, about a nanometer because the more magneton and a few nanometers you can separate them. But then if you want to exchange couple them, you want to be at the Armstrong rate. So in uh, my opinion, this is an open problem that we are actually going to work on next. Because if otherwise the two cube can be gives how do you how do you modulate the exchange coupling between two cubes? No, this and this. Yeah, so uh, that's one question. Okay. So first is intra qubit. The question is how to place this thing. This problem one to be solved. That's something which but I can see from the previous. problem two is how do you yeah. exchange couple this? That's it. Uh, we have not solved this problem yet, but you can think of solutions. For example, you can send a magnon and couple these two, right? So these are all potential solutions to be 
But I think your current problem now is to how to set the six state of one qubit or right. read out another qubit. Right. Experimentally demonstrate single qubit gate and read out. Um, and then, of course, look at the problem of entangling, particularly if you have more than one spin. And it's a many spin to many spin system. Okay, so uh, with this background on the motivation of this common theme, voltage control of magnetism for both classical and quantum computing, I'll start with some very basic energies. This is more like a tutorial, so forgive me if you're already um, familiar with this. Um, but these are the energy terms which are interesting to pay attention to, to interpret uh, the results as we see them next. So the one thing that wants all the spins to stay together is the exchange coupling or the Heisenberg uh, coupling. If they are orienting the spins parallel, you get a ferromagnetic state. If it's anti-parallel, J is negative, then you get an anti-ferromagnetic state. Then you have the demagnetizing field or the shape and isotropy, which is uh, determines like if you have a nanoscale magnet of this shape, if it is small enough, then the magnetization will point along the long axis of the uh, ellipse and not point along the short axis because the fringing fields coming out of this and interacting with these pins make this energetically unfavorable compared to this. If the magnet is big enough, let's say 300 nanometers, it might also form a vortex state where there's continuous rotation of the spins which comes at a cost of exchange penalty, but then the gain in the demagnetization energy is sufficient to justify this as you go to bigger dimensions. You can also have the Zeeman energy where you interact with the global field, and then you have perpendicular anisotropy. For example, when you deposit on certain uh, interfaces, the magnetization will point up or down and not in plane. Um, there's another interesting term that we will use here and that is the Dioshinsky moria interaction that typically happens like if you're looking at the interfacial DMI, you have one spin, another spin, and they are coupled through a heavy metal atom here, and the spins don't want to be parallel or anti-parallel, they would like to be perpendicular to each other. That's the minimum energy state. And whereas the spins rotate like this, or spins rotate like this, is determined by the chirality of the material, and that comes from the sign of this Dioshinsky moria interaction, right? So what happens typically and what we are interested in is if you have exchange plus perpendicular anisotropy, the spins want to be up or down, and the exchange says all are parallel, so you're all either pointing up or all pointing down. But when you have exchange and DMI dominating over TMA, you have one term which wants them to be parallel, one term that wants them to be perpendicular. So each spin will spiral or rotate a little with respect to the adjacent spin, and rotate further and rotate further, so that you get a state which is topologically protected skirmion, which can go all the way from pointing down to the periphery to pointing up in the core and pointing down again on this periphery, right? So, and this kind of rotation can occur as a mean type skirmion or out of plane block type skirmion. And uh, we model all the dynamics by this landau lifshitz gilbert formulation because it's relevant at these scales, um, not the spin dynamics, only the nanoscale magnets. And this is the Lamar precession term, and this is a empirical damping term called the Gilbert term. So, uh, and then of course, uh, the key tools that we have to control the magnetic state, are, which is what our lab is focused on, is the stress anisotropy and the voltage control. So what is stress anisotropy? As I said, you apply a field, electric field to a piezoelectric layer, it deforms. And because of the elastic contact with the magnetic layer on top, it deforms this magnetostricted material. And because the lattice is now deformed, the spins rotate, and that's how you can rotate the classic magnetic state in this large, like 100 nanometer magnet. So this is the term. So when you change the stress dynamically, you can, if you, what you're doing is the energy here is an effective, the energy here, the derivative of the energy contributions come, coming from each of this term with respect to M is in essence an effective magnetic field. So without even applying a magnetic field, by modulating this stress, you're modulating the energy and therefore you're applying an effective magnetic field 
and producing a magnetization V orientation. Similarly, with this VCMA, you apply an electric field that directly affects the anisotropy that is effectively again like applying an effective magnetic field and it rotates or reorients your magnetization. In this game, case from outer plane to each plane. The interesting thing is that these various energy terms control the spin texture in nanoscale magnets. Such energies in this case can be changed purely with a voltage and the response can be in 100, 10 to hundreds of picoseconds. So this could lead to an effective magnetic field without really applying one. And the magnetic field magnitude is not terribly high, it's moderate or small. It is good enough that even with a damped rotation, you can, or a precession, you can get a switching in 100 picoseconds to one nanosecond. So this is not really limited by this, but how, how effective the magnetic field is in rotating or switching the magnetization. But this is still amenable to a device working in the Hertz regime, which is of interest to us. So now let's go at and look at some of the demonstrations, experimental demonstrations in our group on voltage um, control of magnetism. Right. So here, what we have is using strain or saw. This is strain tronics, and using voltage control of anisotropy for its kernels. We will discuss both. So starting with strain, these are uh, experimental results where you have these nanoscale magnets. Um, you, we have visualized them with a magnetic force microscope or magnetic tip, which senses the stray field. And you can see here that this magnetization is in plane pointing in this direction. You have a contrast. Uh, if the magnets are elliptical enough, you can see a contrast, but if they are too elliptical, you cannot switch it because you don't have enough anisotropy to produce the effective field with the stresses applied. So when you have the right design of the magnets, you can switch it. For example, you have two magnets, extremely anisotropic, less anisotropic. This produces a rotation because this is does not have enough anisotropy to switch. This has too much anisotropy, the stress won't switch it. But with this, the anisotropy is less, therefore the stress produces a rotation. And when you let go, this goes anti right? So you're able to use a combination of dipole and stress to uh, switch the magnetic state. You can also go to three magnets where you have most less and least anisotropy. So in that order, this will switch this and this will switch this, producing this down, up, down, anti uh, ferromagnetic, artificially anti ferromagnetic state from the down, down, down state. Uh, of course, all devices don't work because there are lithographic issues. Um, and the quick note here is in terms of logic, this is something that was interesting 10 years ago, but right now, the CMOS performance and logic is uh, not really unbeatable because the switching error, the probability that you switch a magnet from up to down, if it is 10 to the power minus 5 or 10 to the power minus 6, that's not enough because your transistor switches with a reliability of 10 to the power minus 15, right? So this is a good time to understand that any of this switching is not amenable to logic, conditional logic, especially with dipole coupled. But it's good for memory, it's good for neuromorphic improving. So from a device, that's uh, the thing to play at a cheap. Also from a fundamental result point of view, and this also has applications I'll go into later, you need not just use direct strain, you can also use a surface acoustic wave. And what happens is you launch a surface acoustic wave here from the transmitter. This receiver is just to note, uh, quantify that you have a uh, wave propagating with minimal loss and in the delay line you put nanomagnets of uh, which are slightly bigger 300 to 240 to 50 nanometer thick and what you can show is if you set it in a magnetic state pointing up after you apply stress it goes into a vortex state right and the reason it goes into a vortex state repeatedly like you set it this way it goes to a vortex state reset with the field it goes to this state is when you apply some stress the magnetization begins to rotate but then at some point, instead of rotating through 90 degrees, it's easier to form a vortex where the slight energy penalty for exchange with each pen aligning differently, that energy cost is very little compared to the large energy saving when you form a closed flux domain. And therefore you go, you do this one way transition and you cannot get it out unless you break the symmetry by applying a large field. 
However, you can show that if you do have a field in the presence of the switching and smaller magnets, you can also get a switching from the up to the down switch. Um, and this is an experiment with an actual magnetic tunnel junction. The rest were just nanoscale magnets characterized with MFM. This is the one with, uh, produced by Jamping's group where they fabricated uh, a hard layer, a uh, tunnel barrier, and a soft layer. And then what happens is when you apply a voltage, it produces a strain, it actually rotates the magnetization, which then changes the resistance, right? So you can see it because you can change the coercivity as a function of the voltage applied, and you can also apply voltage and measure the change in the magneto resistance repeatedly. The only caveat is this is in a several micron scale device, and it works reliably. Whereas when you go to the 100 nanometers, the surface, the defects, everything dominate and such, the switching is not as clean as, as you would see in a microscope. Now it shifts gears a little. We go from strain to voltage control of anisotropy. And here what I do is calculate the energy densities. And typically stress and strain can give you reasonably speaking an energy density of 10 to the power four joules per meter cube. Whereas when you use the direct voltage control of anisotropy, assuming one nanometer oxide layer and a one nanometer free layer, the change in perpendicular anisotropy, that density can be 10 to the power six joules per meter cube. Why is this important? Because as your memory device shrinks, its volume becomes small. So when you have a very small volume, you need a very high anisotropy. Why do you need a high anisotropy? Because you want to keep your energy barrier Anisotropy times the volume constant at one electron volt, which is 40 kT at room temperature, so that you won't be inadvertently switched switch from up to down. So when we went to the Skelmion experiments, we don't use strain, but we use VCMA instead. And in this, uh, this structure, which was fabricated at UCLA, the idea, the key, uh, into the key layers in the stack are this iridium manganese, which is an antiferromagnet, which produces an exchange bias as well as DMI in the interface with this Kofi B. And then you have this Kofi B MGO interface where you get the perpendicular magnetic anisotropy as well as the voltage control of this anisotropy. You have additional uh, oxide layer as well as IPO so that it's transparent. And these are not nanoscale magnets. These are actually several microns, hundreds of microns. Um, and what you what was done is if you do an anomalous Hall effect measurement and you look at this zero bias, you can clearly see that it's not symmetric about zero, right? The reason it's not symmetric about zero is because there's an exchange bias coming from the antiferromagnetic layer. So this is an effective magnetic field already present without your applying a magnetic field. Additionally, you can see at the zero condition or zero field condition, not all of them are here in the saturated state. Some of them have already begun transition, like this sample and this sample. That means that when you're in the non-saturated state or you have started transitioning, you're most likely to find skirmions and domain walls there, even when you don't apply any magnetic field or have a zero magnetic field. So there are two additional confirmations. You can show the skirmion Hall effect, which is like a Magnus effect. When you apply a current in this direction, a paramagnetic skirmion will not move in a straight line. It will actually have a small uh, motion perpendicular to the drive direction, uh, which is one signature of the skirmion. The other is, of course, if you do a magnetic force microscopy uh, profile, like you go across this narrow, this uh, structure here, you see that the stray field profile, which is like this, looks like a, a simulated profile of an actual skirmion where you have only one sense of rotation uh, because of the chirality that comes in from the duration scheme of interaction and not a trivial bubble which would have a signature like this. So this kind of proves that uh, this is a skirmion. What we also did is do did magnetic force microscopy um, and the way this is done is you take this stack apply a negative voltage, which will increase the perpendicular magnetic anisotropy. So this is what we did, uh, my students did, by looking at uh, the stack, characterizing it several times to see that uh, it doesn't change. So this is a stable structure. Then you apply this field or voltage, then you withdraw the voltage and do an MFM again, 
and you see that you have annihilated all these kernels. And then you apply voltage in the opposite direction. So instead of having high perpendicular magnetic anisotropy, in the first case, you are lowering the anisotropy. So the DMI then has control and forms these skirmion states. Now, not all skirmions that were destroyed were recreated, but the ones that were recreated are at the same space at the original skirmion. So you can do this several times and it's repeatable. You will get these skirmions back and annihilate them and get them back and so on. Uh, there are other details. For example, there seems to be a role of pinning sites which uh, kind of biases or creates the nucleation of these skirmions. And we can also show expert, um, with micromagnetic simulation that this is indeed the case, that you can start with them, you can destroy, and then you can recreate a few of the skirmions. And if you just suppose the experimental results here with the uh, micromagnetic simulations, you can clearly explain how these uh, inhomogeneities are responsible for the formation of skirmions. So in summary, we can, in a non-volatile fashion, create an annihilate skirmions and also other chiral domains um, in this heterostructure. And uh, we, our micromagnetic uh, simulations corroborate what we find experimentally and this could lead to novel magnetic computing devices, which will go into this. So having looked at the fundamental aspects of nanoscale magnetism and experimentally controlling them in two cases, a nanomagnet and a skirmion, let us see what is the practical importance of these two devices. So the first one was the skirmion um, example that I gave you. So a skirmion itself, um, moving in a plane, there are a lot of racetrack skirmion devices, so we kind of wanted to stay away from there. Our interest is to look at skirmions which are in pattern structures. So you really don't have a background magnetic field coming from the rest of the film. And this is very interesting because what you can do is have a state which is ferromagnetic hot. You reduce the anisotropy, the spins in the center want the spins in the periphery to curl out, right? So you, when you reduce the anisotropy, you form a skirmion. When you increase the anisotropy again, either the core can influence the surrounding spins or the periphery can influence the core. And the peripheral spins which have more surface area move inwards, squishing the core and making your magnetization point downwards. Right? So essentially you are getting a ferromagnetic reversal going from up to down to this very specific skirmion space. If you repeated this and lowered the anisotropy again, in fact, you can get a skirmion where the core is reversed. So you go from a topological charge of plus one to minus one approximately, right? And this is only possible because if you had an infinite film and you change the anisotropy, your skirmion would grow and come back, right? You would not be able to destroy it without inhomogeneity and you would never be able to switch it. But in a pattern structure, because you have the boundary, you are able to do this kind of manipulation. At least that's what we theoretically see. But from a device point of view, what is more important is to forget about inverting the skirmion, but just use this intermediate skirmion to switch from up to downstream. And if you do a comparison, why would we do this? So if you look at traditional VCMA, all you can do, you do not have anything to break the symmetry. So you take the magnetic field and you drive it into an inflame state. But if I let my and anisotropy go back, my magnetization 50% of the time would go up, 50% of the time would go down. So you have to produce an external magnetic field around which it processes and switches. And when there's any inhomogeneity associated with this or uh, incoherence, then you affect the switching rates. So if you put a lot of thermal noise and defects, you would get a very poor switching rate. Whereas in this case, what we find with our simulations, it seems to be extremely robust to this kind of switching behavior. And in fact, if you look at this, our, our collaborator did make and demonstrate a one kilobyte chip, uh, kilobit chip using this VCMA scheme, except that there were error problems associated there. So the hope is that if you could use the, almost the same structure, but the skirmion state, which makes it robust to switching, then you could solve that problem uh, associated with the L. Why does this happen? What we believe is that when you're going from this state to this state, there's a large phase space around which you can have this transition, right? 
And typically what happens in the transition is you break into an incoherent state. So if you accept the fact that you can go into this incoherent state, but control it by forcing it to a fixed skirmion state, you're pinching or restricting the phase, uh, space through which this transition occurs, right? So because it's more controlled, it appears to be more robust to travel noise and users. And uh, there are several other things like what happens, can you scale this down to 20 nanometers? Because at that scale, you need a large BMI to produce this one for rotation of space. But you can solve the problem by choosing the higher MS, which is against the conventional wisdom in films, because in films you want a low MS or perimagnets. But when you have a pattern structure, the higher the MS, the easier it is for you to rotate the spins by aiding the DMI. And therefore, you can get off with experimentally observed DMI. So our next real work is to demonstrate this entire physics that we predict in a dot, which is less than 100 nanometers, to actually show the divider. And I was talking about acoustic scaling, and, and I said that the stream really does not work at small scales. But this also can be solved using what is called acoustic fMR. So you realize that the same energy is not enough to rotate or budge the magnetization in a single cycle. But if you apply an acoustic wave, which then is, effect, is basically an effective magnetic field and it produces a ferromagnetic resonance, what happens is you have a magnetization outer plane. You have a strain that is pulling it in plane, but it's also rotating. So you do this and over several cycles, you produce a large deflection, at which point you can apply a relatively smaller spin current to switch it from up to down. And uh, if you choose materials with low damping, then you can get larger deflections. And some simulations uh, in our group show that even if there are inhomogeneities and other things, as long as the precession amplitude is large, because of the exchange penalty being high, they will all synchronize and produce a large deflection. And uh, experimental work right now, we are trying to do this kind of rotation by building these solids and use PR moves to look at the diamond, or even regular move to look at the candidates or how much deflection. So this was uh, with respect to memory. Uh, you can also use these uh, nanoscale magnetic devices for synaptic weights in neural networks. So I won't go too much into details here, but essentially one type of a neural network which uses weight and sum does precisely this. You have an output that is weighted and then it's all summed together. This weight typically is stored in memory and fetched and then you do the multiplication and then you do the addition, so it's costly. If you can store that in a non-volatile device, then you can kind of do the compute with the memory next to it. And because it's non-volatile, once you write it, that information is there forever. But the only problem is when you use these nanoscale devices, the kind of accuracy you want to have in this way is a 32-bit floating point number. But here you can only have five states, right? And as you all know, nanoscale devices have a lot of variations, so they're inherently stochastic. In other words, if I want to write here, I will never be able to move here. I might move here or here or here. But here, even if I control it with a notch, 90% of the time I come here, but 5% I may be here or here, right? So in fact, if you do the simulation, you can show that in this particular class of devices, you have a very controlled voltage where you want it to stop at this point, but you often get a distribution about that point. So you have a device which is crappy in terms of it's stochastic, it's a very low, um, um, it can sto store only limited information, but can you still use it in a useful manner? So that's where we need to, I mean, my student really went into the algorithms part of it, where there are algorithms from the computer science community, where there are ways in which you can quantize. So what you do is when there's an error, you back propagate the error with very high accuracy weights, but then you quantize those weights and store it on this limited states, which could be a few bits. In the extreme scale, it would be binary, or in our case, it would be three states, five states, etc. in this device. And it so happens that when you have stochastic devices, if you are, when you're updating your weight, if you are within some tolerance regime, you don't even bother to change the weight, because if you don't change the weight now, it's okay on the next pass, the other weights will change to adjust an update. So with this kind of uh, algorithm, what we could show is if you had 
a neural network with exactly the same topology, same number of neurons, same number of layers as the 32 bit resolution here. If you have a binary, of course, you're not going to, you're going to have a very large loss of accuracy, but with three states and five states, you can almost get as close as possible to your 32 bit, right? So this is an instance where you use a specific algorithm for a specific device to actually solve or exploit your device um, stochasticity, but limitation of limited noise. So you're actually using crappy device to do highly efficient or highly accurate uh, recognition or learning. Um, and so this could be a promising direction. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah, you said that the computation at the nodes is in memory. Right. Right. So during the back propagation, uh, how do you? Okay. So in this specific paper, we didn't uh, address the back propagation. We assume that you do the back propagation of chip, but not on this but in some kind of a tensor processing unit and then update to weights. But we have an ongoing work with Rajesh's group at uh, IIT Ruki, where they're trying to do the backdrop also with a CMOS algorithm. So that everything is done in hardware, but we don't have the numbers yet. So that's, that's a future way of doing both the forward and the back pass with a hybrid CMOS uh, uh, non-volatile. more like if the memory is being changed in place, the computation is in place. Right. For the back propagation, you could require previous for the update. So usually if you are doing that kind of a thing, what you will have to do with the back propagation, you will still have to do it with very high accuracy. Because many times you take a derivative which is not approximate. So you have to store those high accuracy weights and then you, you can use a really cheap um, digital, digital analog converter to apply voltages to write your two states. So only the stored states are low accuracy. The computation of backdrop is still being done at uh, high accuracy. So the question is, if you want to do a real performance thing, then you should compare CMOS to this in backdrop, and CMOS to this in inference, and get the numbers in terms of area as well as energy. Okay, so now to go with uh, another interesting area where you can use nanoscale magnets is an idea called reservoir computing. And the idea here is that you use recurrence networks when you want to have correlations, for example, in time. So if, I'm, if there is a string, I want to correlate t equal to zero with what's happening at t equal to 10, t equal to 20, etc. And the way this, uh, for this, what happens is each layer of the network not only talks to the next forward layer or one way, but there should also be information flowing backwards or between layers, etc. And this makes the back propagation hard. But in the reservoir setup, you have inputs that drive this reservoir to some dynamics. Obviously, if you excite this magnet, it will excite this and it will excite and this information will come back, right? Because you can also a perturbation in this would produce a perturbation in this, a perturbation in this, and perturbation in this. So now, after let's say t equal to 5, this information has gone here and come back here at t equal to 10. And that is again interacting with information that is coming here. So what came at t equal to 0 has come back here at t equal to 10, or at least a part of it, and it is interacting with information given at t equal to 10. So that way there's recurrence or the two information are interacting, except that if you have a large damping, then this uh, information dies up, right? So if you have a lower Gilbert damping, you can have this kind of short-term memory, and you have non-linearity in the system. Therefore, this computing is done in this reservoir. The only disadvantage is once you make a reservoir like this, you cannot change the rates again, right? Because the rates are all fixed, because the distances that will come or whatever physical parameter is fixed. So all that you have is your outputs, and then you can apply the different weights and the outputs can be changed, uh, trained by linear regression. So one I other idea we had, of course, is again, instead of encoding digitally, you can look at a constant 5 hertz wave, but you can modulate its amplitude and give that as an input, and then you can take the output and then do linear regression for you to recognize some patterns. So uh, the two 
thing. One is what's called short term memory, um, and that turns out to be about five, which is good performance for a um, device of or this many magnets. And then you also can do what's called a parity check, which shows the nonlinearity, and you show that it's also reasonably high. And not shown here, we can also take a Mecca glass kind of stochastic equation and predict it after training this uh, thing for a few distances. And all these cases show that this kind of computing is useful for very simple applications at the edge. Because you cannot retrain these weights, they are fixed. You probably cannot uh, do it for all applications or for more complex applications. So the real problem the student is trying to solve is how far can you push the envelope to do useful computing with this? And how is it dependent on physical parameters such as coupling, dipole, or uh, Gilbert damping, etc., in uh, making this uh, useful? So this kind of uh, brings me to the end of um, the device application for classical memory and neuromorphic computing. So I just want to highlight a little more on the quantum control of spins with nanoscale magnets. So in this case, what we are doing is I kind of repeat or reiterate again. You have already seen how to control this nanoscale magnet, whether it's with strain or VC and right. So all you're doing is moving the magnetization in plane to outer plane or in some direction, which produces a near field microwave or um, RF. Now this can be made resonant to the, let's say this is electron spin of a qubit sitting here and therefore implement qubit gates. And as I mentioned, there was a question here, what happens if I don't use a single spin, I use um, 25 spins, right? The problem I have is if there is a single magnet sitting here going up to down, this magnet is closer to this spin than it is to this spin, right? So there's going to be an AC field also will have a gradient, in which case all the, there is going to be some details, right? Or if there's a DC field or an AC field gradient, then there's going to be dephasing between these magnets. So what we want to do is minimize this gradient. And the way we will minimize the gradient is just to have two symmetric uh, magnets so that you have a gradient like this, a gradient like this, which kind of cancel off and you can almost get no gradient and therefore prevent dephasing, right? And there are other schemes, for example, you can apply a spin polarized current to initialize your qubits in one state. And then um, what was also shown and also interesting is you understand that this magnet is highly nonlinear. It's pointing in this direction. You apply a voltage, you apply some more voltage, it just budges. But at the exact time, this anisotropy equals in a perpendicular anisotropy, you will get a large rotation. So if you're looking in the frequency domain and I'm giving a nice sinusoidal voltage to my nanoscale magnet, the magnetization dynamic or the AC field that produced will have this very strong higher harmonics. Right? But in spite of this, using some NR, NMR techniques, um, you can control the number of uh, exact number of um, cycles that you will apply. And if you have to stop mid cycle, you have to stop your pulse, there's going to be ringing. So with all those controls, the, NM, the group with expertise in NMR that worked with us showed that with right pulse shaping, you can get different gates like pi by two gates, pi gates, etc., with very high fidelity, like 99.99% gate fidelity per single gate. Yeah. So what I mean by quantum control is just rotating it on the block speed, or it's just a single qubit gate can be implemented. With the nanoscale magnets providing the test. Okay. So, uh, so this brings us uh, to the end of the talk in terms of the different things we can do with this voltage control of nanoscale magnetism. Clearly, uh, this is an extremely energy efficient uh, paradigm. There are um, challenges to scaling, but solutions also exist. There are these dynamic magnetoelectric effects that could be key to scaling memory, as well as the rich physics could be used for some neuromorphic computing applications. And this seems to be an interesting way to produce scalable quantum computing with spin qubits. In terms of the architecture itself is scalable because you can have individual control of qubits. Uh, it is relatively easy to initialize because you can apply a spin orbit torque that polarizes in one direction. 
readout still requires an effort, effort because uh, reading out single spin is not trivial. If you have an ensemble of spins, maybe it makes it easier with fewer attempts of readout, readout to reconstruct the quantum state. And then, of course, if you have multiple spins for the readout, how do you entangle multiple spins with multiple spins? These are all challenges. So, in terms of future directions, uh, look at in terms of the quantum effects, which uh, is uh, interesting uh, to look at. When you have single atoms, for example, you can have large anisotropies, but when you put a bunch of atoms together, you don't necessarily get one EV. That's because of crystal fields, etc. So, one uh, quantum challenge in classical computing is how can you scale to the smallest possible size uh, and still have this one EV barrier, in my opinion. The other interesting thing is, as I was mentioning, if you have this uh, multiple spin, spin sphere for easy here, if there's dipole coupling between them, they're going to produce weak phasing, they're going to lose information. But what if you bring them close enough that in spite of the dipole defacing, there's exchange coupling, right? So if one defaces this way and one defaces this way, the exchange pulls them back. Is there some inherent error correction in the physics itself? So these uh, could be interesting problem to look at. And I just acknowledge my presentation. Thank you. for this uh, wide ranging talk. Question for the audience. Because that you cured for the magnetic microscope. Uh, this is for the sternium or for the sternium? This is the first of the screen. So uh, again, if you look at the magnets below, uh, this, for example, is dark and bright. But as here you see bright, slightly bright, dark, dark. Right? And again, it's like this, dark, bright, Whereas you have this dark, it's not very clear, but bright, bright, dark, dark, etc. So the way you look at it is you have a tip and a here. It is tapping, right? So if you have a field in this direction versus a field in this direction, it's going to affect the tapping phase, etc. So that gives you the dark white contrast and the image shield. So if you have dark, let's say you assume that your stray field is like this. If you have bright, your stray field is like this. You have a nanoscale magnet sitting here. This is bright, up, dark, down. So your in plane, if you know that the magnetization is in plane, then the direction should be there. So this would be bright, this would be there. Now if you have a vortex state, it would be completely different. You have this, 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 and you have some stray fields at those transitions, which is what you need. So you have to interpret the difference. How does the qubit density compare to the current C quantum density? You are talking about the classical? Yeah, those uh, qubits that you showed the multiple. Okay, so uh, the density is small because you could uh, technically, if you have 25 spins and you are segregated them so that you're not in interaction, you could have a 5 by 5 area. But the real issue is not the density of the qubit itself, but what is the separation to the next qubit, right? And that comes because, let's say, the way you're choosing to control your qubits individually is with this magnet. Let's say it's 50 nanometers, or some dimension here. So you keep this proximal by 50 nanometers. You need to have the next qubit far enough that this field is not going to affect that. So let's say a micron or a couple of microns. That is the but the question is the longer the distance, of course, how do you entangle them and the test of the point? 
how this stress was in, uh, induced in the material. It was mechanical stress. Uh, which which the stress in the material. Stress is mechanical stress. Yes. So you, you have a piezoelectric layer, you apply a voltage, that strains. The strain is if you have something deposited on this, this will also strain and that changes the mechanism. But not permanent stress. You can uh, like switch off. Yes, so if you switch off, it will come back. But what, what I'm saying is if you have a way of switching this from here to here, even when the strain is switched off, it will stay here. That means if you come back here, the strain will stay. And the other is not strain this, it's a direct voltage based for this. So I think somewhere you mentioned that this turbulence are topologically connected. Right. Does it mean that the local perturbation to one of the strains does not yeah, It is generally robust in the sense if you take the ideal case in a, in, with no inhomogeneity is no defensive tension, you would have a strain with. Right, and that's your experiment. If you modulate the anisotropy or any parameter here, you would stretch it further or make it smaller. You can't really destroy it in that sense. If you have any inhomogeneity defects, then yes, you can destroy it safe. But um, so that's what I mean by protective. But it really doesn't work if you are looking at the boundary. Because what happens in the boundary is if I'm ideally stretching it out, I can just drive all these things away. That sense make it ferromagnetic upward. I think somewhere later you also mentioned how does an intermediate state for the ferromagnetic behavior. Right. So how does that work? Is there a really strong field that applies? There is no field that applies, right? So here it's purely you're having anisotropy, which is making it point in this direction. You lower the anisotropy, the DMI makes you do this and point. Could you go to the guidance slide? Yeah, right. It might be very trivial. So the first one is straight, three is good. Right. Yeah, uh, I think the student. Sure. Uh, so what is the reason? Uh, just I want to know about the X with the bias. Okay, uh, so again, the thickness is 1.19 nanometer, and this is uh, sensitive for this reason. This perpendicular anisotropy is a surface effect, right? So at the COPB and uh, MGO interface, there is going to be an isotropy that wants it to stay this way. So whenever there is an isotropy in the material, there is stress. Because you need a large field, negative field, to drive it to this direction. As the thickness increases, the anisotropy typically goes down. The reason this happens is because you have a surface effect and it scales with the volume. So this surface effect only applies for a few atomic layers. When you need to thin, it is gone, and it goes from outer plane to almost in plane. So if you destroy the anisotropy, what happens? You get up. So the reason is, and I didn't mention this, but when they fabricate it, they have a lot of variation in the COPD thickness because it's an inclined deposition. The reason is that different devices like this will have different properties like this. Therefore, you can find the best device to do your screen. Okay, uh, okay thank you very much. So, was there anything online? No. Should we stop the